Uh, well, my name is Gary Stripling, and I'm the project manager of the Leon B. Spencer research team. Um, we are organized underneath the uh, National Wing, Na I'm sorry, National World War II Glider Pilots Committee. I would like to share a very short video that shows some of the work that we do. This, the names you see crossing your screen right now are a list of names of, of families that have contacted us just in the past year requesting information on World War II glider pilots, glider mechanics, and tow crew relatives. Just since the first of the year, we've had almost 70 families contact us. Often, uh, our research uncovers very unique stories, and we post those stories or create those stories and post them in our uh, quarterly briefings. Our team has access to literally thousands of pages of archive materials and documentation that we use to help locate uh, information. We can often give families this example of an interrogation check sheet which came a few days just after being in combat by a glider pilot. Sometimes we can find those and provide those to the families. We give them these reports, and the unique thing is they were literally signed, in most cases, by the glider pilots just days after flying into combat enemy territory. It, they do detail what happened in combat. We consider this a partnership with the families. Uh, oftentimes, we receive photos, letters, and orders that we don't have, ac that we didn't have access to or didn't have uh, available to us. And this exchange often helps us with information for other families. We have affirmed many times from our contact with families that the World War II veterans are known for being reluctant to share their war experiences. This is not because what they did in the war was unimportant or insignificant but because they viewed their service to their country as their duty, as their job, and not something to be bragged about or even talked about. Many came home tight-lipped with their spouses, families, and friends about what happened in the war. Quote, he never talked about the war, end quote, is a common theme we hear today as families ask us for help in discovering what their World War II glider pilot, glider mechanic, or tow crew relative did during the war. It is with great privilege that we honor the stories of these World War II veterans and the incredible contributions they made more than 70 years ago on the battlefields of World War II. It is also a pleasure to have two veterans with us today to talk about their experience. The 94th Flying Training Squadron and their 306th Flying Training Group at the Air Force Academy offered to host our veterans for this symposium. Attending were glider pilot Roger Smith, who flew a glider in the invasion of Southern France, and glider mechanic Curtis Cameron, who was very involved with reclaiming gliders from the combat zones. Unfortunately, early in the week, Roger was not able to make the trip to the Academy but his neighbor and good friend, Zach Cronley, quickly helped Roger put a video together. We will share Roger's video and then hand you off to the 94th. My name is Roger William Smith, and I retired at the rank of major I was born and raised in Flemington, New Jersey. I was assigned to the 8th Squadron, 62nd Group, 51st Troop Carrier Wing, and 12th Air Force. I started flying on my own uh, in, right after I got out of high school. I think it was in... September of 41, and uh, I took lessons, and while I was up at the airport taking lessons, they got information about uh, 
the civilian pilot training, and but I'd have to join the service first. And I figured, well, why not? So I, I went out in Allentown, Pennsylvania, and joined the service, and I took this civilian pilot training. And while I was there, they come out with the glider pilot deal. And I don't know why I raised my hand there, but I did. <laughs> so that's how I got in the gliders. And I, after I finished that civilian pilot training, uh, they sent me, I got orders from the Air Force to go to Albuquerque, New Mexico. And it was just a pool for glider entry people. So we stayed there a couple of weeks, I guess. And then we got on a train and went to Fort Morgan, Colorado, where we made dead stick landings. That was our primary training. And uh, yeah, we, I forget the month, I think it was the last part of November, we were shipped to 29 Palms, California, where we took the basic. And we had nice living quarters there. And the weather was good. And we, we flew uh, several night missions with the uh, BT 13s towing us. Uh, I can remember one night the lights, navigation lights on the BT went out. So the guy, I forget which side of the engine the exhaust came out, but the glider. Was could see the exhaust on that BT. He held his position, and the other glider kept his position on the glider. And we we made it all right. Yeah. But um, we graduated there as staff sergeants. And. Uh, from there, we were shipped to Fort Sumner, New Mexico. It was just a pool for glider pilots. We got our flying time in with L4s and stuff like that. And um, we, uh, I forget how long we stayed there, probably January, February. Couple months anyway, we shipped out and went to Roswell. Didn't do anything special there, it was another pool. And finally, we got uh, to Lubbock, Texas for our advanced. And I think it was in. July or August, 42, no, 43, yeah, 43. And uh, we had a, a good course there. We had uh, aircraft recognition and weather, meteorology and stuff. We finally Graduated on October 26, 1943. We got our wings and graduated as flight officers. And uh, uh, I went back to New Jersey and 
I got married. And then we had orders to go to Bowman Field, Kentucky. We uh, did some night flying there and landed with nothing but smudge pots for landing on the airfield. Yeah, it was. Then we went to uh, Fort Knox, Kentucky for our training in several pieces of armament. We threw grenades. We fired two different types of machine guns, rifle, pistol, and uh, that was, uh, I think, in February of '44. We got orders to go back to Lubbock again, and uh, we flew such flights that they call them blitz toes. They didn't get over a thousand feet, maybe lower than that, and they were just low altitude. We'd cut off and glide not very far on land. And uh, that was good practice for combat, I found out. Yeah. And then, then we went to a, a base in Indiana where they sort of prepared us for overseas. And then we went to Newport News, Virginia for the boat ride across the Atlantic. It took us nine days. We left on March 31st, and we arrived in Casablanca on April 9th, I think it was. That was uh, quite an experience, but we made it. And from Casablanca, we got on a train. It was called uh, the 40 and 8, 40 people and 8 cattle in the car. We went almost all the way across North Africa. We stopped at uh, a French base called Constantine, I think. We had to stay there a while. Then we got on uh, trucks, six by six trucks, and went the rest of the way to Bizzardi. And at Bizzardi, we got on a small vessel and went to Naples. We stayed there a couple nights. I know one night we had a, a air raid. The Germans come over and bombed the Naples Harbor. We got through that all right. But then we got on another ship and went to Palermo, Sicily. And we got on trucks and went south in Sicily there to Gila, something like that. It was a it was a monastery where we stayed. Yeah. We stayed there a while. From there we went to Rome, and uh, let's see, yeah, and then we had several glider flights in Rome, and uh, We had a, this was coming up in August, 44. Uh, we had a, we 
had a briefing. We knew we were going into southern France, but we had a dry run on the 14th of August. And uh, I was paired up with a, another Glada pilot named Erling Severson. And we, uh, we flipped a coin as to who would pilot on the uh, dry run. So Severson won. And the next day was the 15th, which was the day we were supposed to go to southern France. And we flipped the coin again, and I won. I still got the coin. Well... I was married to a, a girl who had real blonde hair and I kind of, instead of calling her Glenna, which was her right name, I called her Blondie and kind of stuck with her. We had a three hour and 15 minute flight across the Mediterranean. and. Uh, When we got close to the beach where we were supposed to enter into southern France, I could see P-38s and P-47s strafing the coast off my left. I guess they were strafing. I didn't see any bombs exploding. And then uh, we flew inland not too far and waited for the green light on the top of the C-47 and we cut loose. And uh, as soon as we cut loose, old Severson say, hey, Smitty, you watch for other gliders and pick your spot. I'll call off the airspeed to you. And I say, that's fine. I can remember when I was on my final approach, I looked over to my left, down on the ground. This one glider was landing, and he hit the right wing first and just cartwheeled. Uh, that's very vivid in my memory. And uh, I picked a spot, but on the way there, oh, I, somebody else had that spot. So I made a nuts turn, landed in a grape vineyard. And as I touched down, uh, about a couple of seconds after I touched down, I heard a big noise. I didn't know what it was at the time, but we found out we, we hit something that took the landing gear off. And that actually helped us slow down a little bit. <laughs> that was a water purification unit. And apparently it weighed a lot because it didn't take me long to get down on the ground after I was released. This is a picture of my glider right after we landed. And as you can see, there's dents in the, each wing where the Germans had set up poles as obstacles for us to land through. And, uh, and as you can see, is the picture is not very clear. And that's because I think I was a little excited. I didn't know whether I took a picture or not. So this is a double exposure. <laughs> but uh, we didn't see any signs of the enemy when we landed, so we went to the command post and dug foxholes and stuff like that. And I think two days we were there. We had some German prisoners, and I was one that was elected to help march them back to the coast. And uh, 
from there we got on a LST or something, took us back to Cali, Corsica, and uh, we got on a C-47 a couple days later and went back to Rome. And uh, after we were there a week or two, we were notified that we could volunteer for being a co-pilot on a C-47. Boy, I, I wanted to fly, so I did that. And I, I enjoyed that. Got about 200 hours on the co-pilot and an hour and a half as, as first pilot. I, I really liked that. And we were stationed at Tarquinia. We were stationed at Siena, Italy. We flew over France most of the time. We did get to land in Vienna, Austria one time. Eventually, uh, in September of 45, why, they were sending a lot of people home, so we, we went up to Laverno, Italy, and got on a coal collar, and we, we left September 30th and got to Baltimore, Maryland, on the, I think the 14th of October. And we went to Indian Town Gap, Pennsylvania, and for separation. But I, uh, during that time, I signed up for the reserve. And, uh, Then I uh, took a bus to my home in New Jersey. Well, I think we were rated very high. Uh, a lot of guys said, uh, hey, power pilots, uh, they got a nice smooth runway to land on. We got great vineyards to land on, so that's the way it goes for glider pilots. Yep. <laughs> 